I live a stone's throw away from the waves, the kind of place that's as unassuming as the life I lead. In a large house, where the salty air never quite leaves, I spend my days teaching at the local high school and my evenings listening to the sea. It's just me and John most days, my husband. He's a rep for a trading firm always on the phone or typing away on his laptop, trying to make ends meet. Then there's our Annie, out there living her fresh out of law school life. I remember the day she told us she'd be specializing in divorce law. We were sitting right here at this old wooden table that's seen better days. Annie had that look she gets when she's serious, her brow all furrowed. Mom, Dad, I'm going into divorce law, she declared, like she was bracing for a storm. John looked up from his plate, a piece of steak half-sliced, and his eyes met mine like we were both thinking the same thing. Divorce, huh, he said, the word hanging in the air like it didn't belong in our home. Annie leaned back, a challenge in her posture. Yeah, and don't worry, if you guys ever get tired of each other, I can hook you up with a good deal. She tried to make it sound light, a joke, but her jokes always sound like she's half serious. John's laugh was a grunt, more air than sound. A comedian, our daughter, he said, his tone dry as sandpaper. I tried to smooth things over, keep the peace. Annie, love, we're fine, but it's good you've got a plan. My words felt hollow, even to my own ears. Annie just shrugged and took another bite of her food, but I saw the way her eyes narrowed. She always was too smart, too perceptive for her own good. Annie's visits are the only times John puts his darn phone down for longer than a minute. She breezes in like the fresh sea wind, all bright and full of that big city lawyer energy. How's the old seaside retreat? She'd ask, the nickname for her home she coined as a teenager. John would throw an arm around her shoulder. Standing strong, just like us, he'd say with forced cheer. After another round of small talk, she leaves, and we're back to the sound of the sea. That's our life, a cycle of work, quiet dinners, and the unspoken things that sit between us like unwanted guests. And as much as John bugs me sometimes, with his comments and his distance, I hold on to this life like a lifeline. It's what I know. It's where I'm supposed to be, even if sometimes I wish the sea would rise up and carry me away to somewhere I could start all over, just me, the breeze, and nothing else. The days seemed longer lately, each moment heavier than the last. I felt it most at dinner, that used to be a time for us to talk about our day, to laugh a little. Not so much now. John's words had turned from indifference to sharp jabs. Another casserole, he'd say, eyeing the food like it was an enemy. You know, that's not helping your waistline. It wasn't just the words, it was the way he said them, cold, like he was talking to a stranger. I'd stand there, spatula in hand, feeling smaller than I used to. It's what I had time to make, I would mumble, not looking at him, because if I did, he'd see the hurt in my eyes, and I couldn't let him see that. You could make time for a salad or something. John would push on, his chair scraping back as he'd stand up, ready to dismiss whatever I had to say next. I walk every morning, I'd defend weakly, not that it mattered to him. Yeah, and you walk right back to the fridge afterwards, he'd throw back before making his way to the couch, leaving me to eat alone. I wanted to shout, to throw the casserole at the wall, anything to make him see how those words cut me up inside. But I didn't. Instead, I'd serve myself, eat quietly, and clean up. John, meanwhile, would be shouting at the TV or yapping on the phone, that's how most evenings went by. One night, I gathered the scraps of my courage and tried to confront him about it. I sat next to him on the couch, the TV blaring some sports game. John, can we talk? He half-turned, a frown already making a home on his face. What now? Do you have to be so, so harsh about my weight? I asked, the words felt like heavy stones in my mouth. John snorted. What? I'm motivating you. If I don't say it, who will? You want to get bigger and bigger? That's when the dam broke, the tears came hot and fast, and I couldn't stop them. You think I don't know? You think I don't feel it every single day? My voice was a mix of anger and shame, a cocktail I was getting used to. He stood up then, his body language screaming annoyance. Oh great, here come the waterworks. 
do something about it instead of crying, for crying out loud. I got up, wiped my eyes, angry at myself for letting him see me cry. Never mind, I said, my voice hollow, just, never mind. The room fell silent except for the commentators on the TV. And like that, we'd go to bed, backs turned, walls up, pretending we didn't feel the chasm that was growing between us. It had become our new normal, this walking on eggshells, this biting of tongues until they bled. Sea travel is my husband's new hobby. John wouldn't drop it with the yacht thing. Babe, think about it, sailing wherever we want, whenever we want, he said, thumbing through a glossy magazine that smelled like fresh ink and unrealistic dreams. Sitting there with my knitting needles clicking away, I said, John, we ain't exactly sailors. That money's tucked away for emergencies, not big toys. He tossed the magazine down, it slid across the table landing with the image of a yacht looking up at me as if to say hey, don't I look fun? John followed my gaze. That's just it, Claire. It's always about what if. What if we just did something wild for once? I put my knitting down. A yacht's not just wild, John. It's bonkers. You get green when we cross the river on the bridge. How you gonna handle the ocean? He crossed the room to where I sat and crouched down beside me, took my hands into his. Claire, I just. I want us to have something to show for our work, something to enjoy. You don't think touring the coast, just you and me, doesn't sound exciting? His eyes had that twinkle that I hadn't seen in a long time. They were the kind of eyes that got me to say, I do a couple of decades ago. I chewed on my lip, thinking, you and me, out on the open sea? Just the fish and the stars, and, knowing our luck, a storm or two? John grinned, we'd weather it. Like we always do. Here was my husband, a man that I've shared more than half my life with, looking like a kid asking for a bicycle for Christmas. Something about that was too hard to ignore. I sighed. All right, I won't make any promises, but I'll think on it. Maybe some adventure wouldn't be such a bad thing. John's face lit up like a kid on Christmas morning. Really? You mean it? Yeah, I mean it. But I swear, John, if I see one hint of green on your face, I'm turning that yacht around and selling it to the highest bidder. He laughed and hugged me. Deal, he said, and I couldn't help but laugh, too. Who knows, maybe a bit of sea air would do us both some good. But I was going to think on it long and hard first. There was plenty of time and reasons to be practical, but maybe the impractical was what we needed to shake things up. Maybe. The phone rang a few times before Annie picked up. Hey mom, what's up? Her voice always had a way of sounding like she was in the middle of something big. Annie, we need to talk. Got a minute? I sat on the edge of the bed, playing with the cord of the phone like I used to when I was a teenager. For you? Always. Shoot. I took a deep breath. So, your dad has this crazy idea about buying a yacht with the money grandma and grandpa left me. A yacht? There was a pause, and I could practically hear her rolling her eyes. What are you gonna do with a yacht? That's what I said. But he's all starry-eyed about it. Sailing, adventure, blah blah blah. I'm not sure. It's a big risk, a big expense. Okay, think. This is your money, right? The money grandma and grandpa left for you, not dad's new toy fund. Her words were sharp, but needed. Right. It's mine. For our family. For things like the house or your loans. Exactly. Annie's voice softened. Mom, if you decide to go through with this, this yacht business, make sure it's in your name. Just to cover your bases, you know? There was a wisdom there that I couldn't ignore. You really think I need to do that? Absolutely. Cover your back, Mom. If things go south, or hell, if Dad gets seasick and hates the damn thing, at least it's yours to sell. I chuckled, a real laugh. Your dad, seasick, now that I'd pay to see. See, you're laughing. Yachts are silly. But listen, if it makes you guys happy, who am I to stop you? The chat with Annie got my head straight. She had a point.
I needed to think about what I wanted and to protect myself if things didn't go as planned. It was all fun and games imagining clear skies and calm waters, but I knew life was rarely that kind. So, I should just tell him no? Keep the status quo? I was fishing now, unsure of what I needed her to say. Annie was quick to reply. Hell no, do what makes you happy. But be smart about it. I love dad, but this is a big decision, and it's not just his decision. It's yours too. Thanks, Annie. I needed that, I said, feeling a bit more grounded than before. The call ended on a good note. Annie might just be the most sensible person I knew. The yacht? Maybe it'd be fun. Or maybe it'd be the most expensive mistake of my life. But one thing was for sure, any decision made would be on my terms. I'll never forget the day John and I walked down the dock, keys in hand, towards what could have passed for a small house floating on the water. She was ours. And by ours, I mean mine, because I took Annie's advice and made sure of it. But, credit where credit's due, John was being good about the whole thing, sticking to his word. I can't believe you actually did it, John said, a faint grin on his lips. Neither can I, I said, my voice a mixture of excitement and pure terror. We sat on the deck that evening, just the pair of us, with a couple of cold beers. The sun was dipping low, painting the sky all sorts of oranges and reds. John broke the silence. Claire, I know this was a big ask. Thank you. I glanced at him, surprised. You sure you're not mad it's in my name? He shook his head. Nah. You're steering this ship. Figuratively and, I guess, literally now. We chuckled, clinked our bottles together, and for a moment there was an easy peace between us that I hadn't felt in years. But life, like the sea, doesn't stay calm for long. The next morning, I was clutching a coffee mug, staring out at the gentle waves when our neighbor, Ted, ambled over. He lived alone ever since his wife passed and had the sort of face that told you life hadn't been a walk in the park. Morning, Claire, Ted called out, a smile tucked under his bushy mustache. Morning, Ted. Coffee? He held up his own mug. Already on it. Thanks, though. Just wanted to say congrats on the yacht. She's a beauty. I nodded, appreciating his kindness. Thanks, Ted. Still trying to believe it's real. You folks planning to sail off into the sunset anytime soon? He asked, interest sparking in his eyes. I laughed. Still working out the details. Ted nodded, took a sip. There was an awkward silence before he said, If you ever need a hand with anything, repairs or even a crew member, just shout. Used to do a bit of sailing myself, back in the day. Appreciate it, Ted. We'll keep it in mind. Back home, with groceries put away, I settled onto the couch with a sigh. I was about to dive into my new sailing book when John's voice drifted from the kitchen. Claire, what's for dinner tonight? Figured we'd do something easy. Pizza sound good? I called back without lifting my eyes from the page. Pizza's perfect, he said, coming in to sit beside me. Need any help with planning the maiden voyage? I put the book down. Yeah, maybe. Could use some company going through these charts. As we spread the maps and charts across the coffee table, something about this whole situation felt like we were on an even playing field for the first time. We threw ideas back and forth, sometimes agreeing, sometimes not, but it was all friendly. No arguing, no one trying to pull rank. I'd been floating on the buzz of anticipation all morning, thinking about that cruise John promised. We'd been planning it for months. I'd even taken time off work, unpaid leave no less, to line up with his busy schedule. Today, I grabbed a new suitcase from the department store, something sturdy and bright, you couldn't miss it even if it tried to hide in the belly of our yacht. I came home, key turning in the lock, ready to see John's usual mess of packed stuff all over the living room floor. Only thing is, there was nothing. No mess, no John. Just a hollow kind of silence that makes your heart sink. I called out, John, but my voice bounced around the empty space. 
That's when I spotted the note, all smug like on the kitchen counter and divorce papers underneath, like they were nothing more than a grocery list. Picking up the note, I read his jagged scrawl. Thanks for the yacht, Claire. I'm gonna need it more than you. You always love the sea, right? Well, so does she. The young kind of love. See ya. My hands trembled and the paper crinkled in my grip. I had to read it again because no way did it just say what I thought it did. But there it was, the same word staring back at me. He took the yacht, the new mistress, probably half his age, and left a damn note. Son of a. The shock turned into something hot and angry, but it was the sight of those divorce papers, signed, ready to go, like he didn't care about anything we had, that did me in. My chest got tight. I couldn't catch my breath. I sat down, slow, because it felt like my head was split in two. The note was a blur as I looked at it again. I stood up, shaky on my feet, a suitcase still in my hand like a bad joke. A sick feeling settled in my stomach. He'd planned this, waited until I was out, making plans, buying luggage. And for what? So he could run off with our, no, my, dream? I should have screamed, broken something. Instead, I stood there, hollowed out. I saw my phone on the counter, buzzing with missed calls. I ignored them. What was I supposed to say? Oh, hey, my husband dumped me for a little adventure on the sea. With another woman. Yep, left me with a note. And hey, guess who's newly single? No, I couldn't deal with that yet. I got myself off the floor, leaving the suitcase and the note where they lay. The papers though, I picked them up, the weight of them heavy in my hand. The feeling was starting to come back, a creeping realization that it was over, whatever it had been. I had an urge then, standing in that empty kitchen, to grab that suitcase, chase them down, make a scene. But what for? To be the crazy lady shouting on the docks? No, that wasn't me. The last thing I remember was tossing those papers onto the counter. They landed like a whisper, silent, but so damn loud in my head. Then darkness took me, like the deep sea he'd sailed into, the kind of dark that swallows you whole. Blinking the sleep away, I'm staring up at a bleached ceiling. I'm in a hospital, ain't I? Beeps and blips from machines are my sorry orchestra, a sharp contrast to the sound of the waves I was dreaming of just a minute ago. Annie sitting beside me, her hand like a vice grip on mine. If looks could kill, her eyes are locked and loaded for John, no doubt about it. Hey, look who's back with the living, she says, trying to be light about it, but I can hear the edge in her voice that's just itching for a fight. I'm struggling to find words that aren't just angry spit and fire. How, how long was I out? The room is swimming a bit, so I focus on her face, steady and angry, on my behalf. A couple of hours. They ran some tests, said you fainted from stress. It's the simplicity of that statement that's a slap. Just stress. Not the world-ending feeling of my husband leaving me on an adventure crusade with his new fling, and definitely not the agony of my plans being trampled under his proud feet. Found your note, Annie continues, her fist tightening around the paper she's waving slightly. This is lower than low. If he were here now, I'd... What did you do with the papers? I interrupt her midway because if I let her go on, she'd be spouting murder plans, and honestly, I don't have the energy to calm her down. Signed, sealed and will be delivered first thing when we get you out of here. I'll make sure that he gets them. The disgust in her voice is sweeter than any medicine they've got here. But the bitterness is still in my mouth, like I've been sucking on lemon wedges. Wait, I signed them? I'm scratching my head, not remembering a darn thing. Yeah, the nurse was a witness. You don't mess around, even half-conscious. I can't help but chuckle, which turns into a cough. Well, ain't that something. You need anything? Water, revenge, a hitman? Annie's only half-joking, I can tell. I try to sit up, wincing as the room decides to do a little spin. I just... I need to think need to figure out my next move. Yeah, that's the spirit. Annie pumps her fist, as if to knock out an imaginary John. I take a deep breath, 
the future still one hazy mess. But it's my mess to clean up, my life to straighten out, and no cheating, lying dirtbag husband is gonna stand in my way. So, what now? You gonna lie around here feeling sorry for yourself? Cause if you are, I want to order pizza. Nah, I say, pushing the sheets away and swinging my legs to the side of the bed, slowly finding my ground. I'm starving. Let's get some pizza. That's my girl, Annie says, giving me a hand up. Let's blow this popsicle stand. Holding on to Annie, I know it's not just my legs that need the support, it's this whole new mess I've got to navigate. But with her by my side, tossing ex-husband's notes around with that fireball attitude, I feel like maybe I got a fighting chance after all. The morning after, my daughter, Annie, is sitting across from me at the kitchen table, her laptop open to the online banking portal. Her brow furrows, and she turns the screen to me. Mom, our account, it's empty. I lean in, squinting at the cold zeros staring back. My stomach drops. That snake, I mutter. John had stripped us clean. Annie's fingers dance over the keys, checking the transaction history. He took it all yesterday, she says, her voice low, but fierce. What are we gonna do? I'm about to answer when a thought strikes her. Wait, the yacht. Doesn't it have GPS? If we can find the yacht, we can find him. She's got a point. I reach for the phone without hesitation and dial. Police, I say, my voice steadier than I feel. I'd like to report a stolen boat. Yes, and theft from my bank account too. Annie's tapping away on her phone now, probably digging for the GPS login info. I trust her with tech stuff. She's always been savvy like that. Got it, she says, handing me a slip of paper. The location is scrawled in her neat print. I relay it to the officer on the line and hang up. The ball's rolling now. No stopping it. We head down to the marina, where the yacht is supposed to be. And there it is, all sleek and expensive, exactly where the GPS said it'd be. Cops all around it, blue lights spinning silent in the morning light. And there's John, in handcuffs, blubbering like a baby. Please, Claire, I'm sorry. Call them off. I didn't mean any harm. He wails as we walk up. His mistress is beside him, a fiery thing that snarls and snaps like a cornered animal. Annie steps up before I can speak, her voice cold as January ice. You're going to trial, John. She's eyeing him like something nasty stuck to her shoe. That yacht? Registered in mom's name. And since you divorced her, that grand exit of yours turns into grand theft. I fold my arms, the sea air chilly on my cheeks, watching as John's face crumbles like a sandcastle at high tide. But, Claire, John's plea is a broken record now, skipping on the worst hit of the year. I'll leave her. Just take me back. His mistress freezes, mouth gaping. What? She shrieks, staring him down. Then she's clawing at him, hissing insults that could peel paint. The cops have to pull her off. Annie's watching it all with an eyebrow raised so high it could lift off her forehead. Nice girlfriend you picked. As the dust settles, officers pull John and his screaming mistress away. One of the cops ambles over, tipping his hat. Ma'am, we'll get your yacht back to you, and as for the bank account, you should get at least half of that 15,000 plus damages. I nod, a small, bitter twist to my lips. Thanks, officer. Annie's by my side, her hand squeezing my shoulder. And I'll handle his case. Don't worry, mom. He'll pay for every penny, and then some. As we leave the marina, Annie wraps an arm around me, trying to be the strong one. But I see the anger for her dumb father, the concern for our future. Don't worry, kiddo, I assure her. We got this. She grins, all teeth and resolve. Damn, straight we do. We walk away with the seagulls crying overhead, the chapter closed on a man who thought he could leave us with nothing. But we're still standing, and this tale? It's just another lesson learned. What happened to John? John's reputation is in tatters, his job a lost cause, his mistress bolted as soon as the cuffs snapped shut. He's left with nothing but the echoes of his mistakes.